So the question is, how is Jordan doing? So uh, for those of you that don't know in the room, um, uh, Michaela, Jordan's daughter, recently released a video with an update on what's been happening in the Peterson family. It's been a really rough last six months. Tammy was diagnosed with cancer in March, and uh, it's been a really tumultuous time of ups and downs of figuring out um, you know, how, uh, how that can be resolved. And luckily, she had a third surgery in August and they were able to um, to resolve that and Tammy's doing a lot better but um, while they were going through that period Jordan was on some strong anti-anxiety medication and then he stopped at cold turkey and it really messed with him uh, so he actually checked into rehab in um, just about a month ago uh, the last thing that we heard was that he's been doing a lot better. They realized he was having an allergic reaction to the medication. Uh, so it seems like things are, are going well and uh, they're hoping he'll be able to come back into the public eye maybe even sooner than expected. Awesome. You. A long time ago, or how did you get so much intimate footage? So the question is um, that there was so much intimate footage in the film, kind of surprising, and had I planned this film before. So I wrote the script in 2014, told Jordan when to release the videos. I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> um, I approached Jordan about making a film a year and a half before he released those videos, and I had no idea they were coming. I knew of his work probably 10 to 15 years before that, back when I was doing my undergrad degree in psychology at a different university. I found his work really fascinating, and I knew that he was a life-changing professor at the University of Toronto for many students. It was the kind of class where people would line up hoping to get their five minutes to ask him a question. And so I approached him in 2015 with interest in making a film. And for a year and a half, I was working on a completely different documentary until he released those videos that came as a complete surprise to us. And uh, two or three weeks in, I realized I had to shift gears and put what I was doing on hold and then start a completely yeah, new project. I extra mic, does it work? We can hear you, Angelo. <laughs> can I ask, uh, Jeffrey, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So uh, you saw the CBC cut, you were in that too. How was this, what was this experience like watching this cut as compared to that? Um, I think this cut was excellent because it just showed a lot more of the in-between moments of uh, who Jordan Peterson was as a person. And it, as I've told Patricia multiple times, I thought it was a fairly balanced piece. And she gave a lot of the important players a good amount of voice and this cut especially gave even more time to the ecosystem that surrounds this whole issue that is just beyond Jordan Peterson. Thank you. Are we picking people now? Okay. One of uh, Jordan Peterson's major controversies was in regards to the, uh, n uh, the Aboriginal naming ceremony. Did you get a chance to speak to him about it? And if so, uh, why did you choose not to include it in the video? So the, f uh, the film that I was working on for the year and a half that I was just referring to was actually about Jordan's friendship with Charles Joseph. <laughs> uh, so I knew all about that. I filmed the potlatch ceremony where Jordan was adopted into Charles's family and they've become brothers. Um, one of the crazy things that was happening in the kind of one of the most heated moments of the this controversy erupting was in October 2016 at the same time when these articles were coming out about about him being a bigoted transphobe, we were over at his house and Charles and a chief and some family members had flown in to bless his third floor, uh, which is where he has a lot of totem poles and other carvings from Charles's family that are very sacred and the space was being blessed and that's when Jordan was given his name uh, in Kwakwala, which is Charles's language. Uh, so why didn't I include any of that in this film? It was, it was way too much. Um, there's there, the, the other film, which is tentatively called Mehala, which is a Kwakwala word meaning to dream. 
in that film, in that film, Charles is an equal, equally important character in that film. He's a residential school survivor. He's a, a very raw artist that dreams what he's going to carve. And there's just, there was so much to tell. Um, I did play with the idea of including one or two scenes or something about that in this film, but it was, it was just way too much to try and fit. So that'll be the next film. About that film, one of the choice scenes that I always like to tell people, this is a bit of a producer talk here, is that we got we got Jordan Peterson dancing around a bonfire in Alert Bay, is a remote part of Northern Vancouver Island, and a longhouse uh, surrounded by you know uh, indigenous uh, wise men in wooden masks. So it's this amazing scene. And then another one that really stands out is that Jordan and Charles are driving over from Toronto to Ottawa for a Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, uh, conference meeting. It was the, the Truth and uh, Reconciliation Commission. Commission. And um, they were talking about his experience in residential school and Jordan says, ask him, what was the hardest part about it? And Charles says, it's the smell. It, it's the smell of white people. <laughs> Char Jordan was Charles's first white friend. So imagine this, right? You're a kid, you get taken to a school, you know, and, and Charles says, you know, they, they take you to a room called Bible study, but there isn't a Bible in it. And, you know, he, he's getting molested, right? And, and he shuts his eyes as a kid, and all the other senses get, you know, heightened. So it's this really powerful scene where Pritchard's just in the back filming, and they're just having this candid conversation. So that's the kind of stuff that that film gets into, which is, it's, it's, as Pritchard's saying, it's just completely, um, that deserves its own piece. All right, so we have the next question here. Yeah. Uh, did you feel uh, any pressure not to make the movie? Did you receive any threat not to make it or something like that? I don't think I ever received pressure to not make the movie, but there were definitely a lot of, you know, judgments and some pushback that we got even in our some of our personal relationships uh, that made it challenging. In the first year, things were so, so heated, um, especially in Toronto, you know, when going to certain events and events with other documentary filmmakers, I was very nervous to talk about, hey, what are you working on? Oh, you know that Jordan Peterson guy, the guy that like immediately divides up the room. Um, so it was pretty nerve wracking, I think, for both of us. Yeah, and it's funny to be in this building because I grew up in Burnaby and, you know, after, you know, uh, undergrad, one of the first things that you usually do when you're working in video and design is you work for nonprofits because you don't really know how to use the software and they can, it's just a good way to kind of get some experience. So I worked in a lot of these kind of offices here and it's a lot of social justice stuff. So it's like fair trade Vancouver and um, a theater company. And so it's funny to be back. So it, it kind of tells you a little bit of our Facebook feed and who our friends are, and I guess the, one, the, the ones that are left. So we, we lost some friends making this film. You could say, were they really, how close were they are to us? But So that was hard. But what's been really annoying, and you've heard the stories, we've had three cancellations. Uh, the Carlton Cinema, we had a four week run that was pulled. Um, and that really sucked because uh, mainstream film reviewers don't, do not review films that don't have a weak run. Um, we, the New York Times wanted to uh, review our film, but because we don't have a run in New York or LA, they won't review it. Um, and then we had another one in Brooklyn. We did one screening there, it went great, and then the second one, they canceled it because staff felt uncomfortable, because the content that you guys just saw is deeply offensive, you know? And, uh, like, I could understand if it's something like some sort of, you know, propaganda piece that just caters to one side of the aisle, but that's not what this film is. And then we had another one in Toronto, too, for people that haven't even seen the film, and they wanted us to do a roundtable discussion with us, Jordan Peterson supporters, and some trans folk. Um, and we were like, okay, that's great, let's do it. Um, but even that, and then they changed their mind about that, so that got pulled too. Um, but at the same time, we're also getting a lot of support. So it's been an annoying thing to um, deal with these kind of curators. 
that's why the digital sales are important, the iTunes and Amazon, so. Awesome, so you, you have the next question, right? Uh, sure. All right, Lobster Man. Thank you. Uh, so I've been involved as a leadership for another freedom of expression related group. And uh, in doing that, I found that it's a very difficult tightrope sort of balancing act. And I think that all three of you would have insights onto how to handle that balance, especially when people are trying to censor you. And sometimes you feel like, well, you know, what voices am I elevating and what voices am I, you know, hindering? And uh, how do I manage the conflict and the balancing act? And I think that that's what this documentary was about as well, and also what, what a lot of Dr. Peterson talks about. It. So all three of you, I was wondering, uh, are there any insights you have on how to balance those sort of difficult calls mm -hmm. <laughs> and how to handle with censorship? Yeah, um, so that's a great question because after organizing that rally, um, I joined in for a while with Campus Politics, and uh, back in Toronto, we had this organization called Students in Support of Free Speech. And, um, and it was difficult, as you say, like which voices are you elevating when you create a group like that? And you suddenly become associated with all these people who you do not agree with. And then you create a platform in which people who uh, essentially believe in similar things to you, like freedom of speech or, um, or just living life positively or the messages that um, Dr. Peterson talks about. Uh, and then suddenly you're so associated with people who are more interested in, say, alt-right ideas or more extremist ideas. And um, personally, this is, you don't want to take my advice because what I did was I walked away from that and I started living life. I went to professional school and I try to live life positively and have individual conversations with people about what they believe, why they believe. And it's very fruitful in a place like Vancouver when it, it's sort of an echo chamber sometimes. But I think for me, the best thing was to move forward and live life and be positive and not be so obsessed with the politics, which is not so great advice for someone who's currently running a political group. Uh, so. Not not currently. I'm actually I just graduated, so uh, <laughs> maybe that's good advice. Um, oh, we got we got some. I, I like to comment on that too. Um, so after the uh, New Zealand mass shooting, I wrote this article on my Medium page about. It was called the Anatomy of Outrage. So there's so many emotions with that stuff. And um, I talked to Jordan about that t-shirt. And I just kind of broke the, the t Oh, yeah, the, Jordan took a photo with a guy who wore my proud Islamophobe shirt. And I just kind of broke down the different ways I reacted to it. And I kind of made this analogy of kind of different parts of the body. Check it out. It's a really good article. Um, but um, I remember I was talking to Jordan about it. And just kind of, it's always helpful to talk with people directly because it, it it, the 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 photo pissed me off, but when I talked about it and I broke it down, then I wrote about it. I felt so much better about it. And what I said to Jordan is like, um, what was helpful for me with that is when you're talking to people and they're being antagonistic with you, act as if this person just had the worst day of their life. They just got the worst news they ever got. You know, and uh, I think that's very helpful because. You know, when you're online and nerves are high, and maybe if you're higher in trait neuroticism, Jordan Peterson, uh, student, clearly, um, it helps to kind of take a step back and take a breath. Um, so that would be my advice on that. And the last thing I'll add is um, make a genuine effort to build relationships with people who you disagree with um, and try to it's important to try to really empathize with where people are coming from and like why people are feeling so sensitive about these topics. And you know, when you're creating the spaces to have those conversations, it's just, it's gonna be so tricky for people. And you know, sometimes 
the reactions that you get uh, are really frustrating. Like we've been feeling that way with our cancellations of people citing, you know, safety concerns. If God forbid we bring in like a pro Peterson side into the room, it's like, you know, people in the room are now in danger, right? It's frustrating. Um, but I think it's still important to keep that empathy piece and to um, try to really understand where the other side is coming from. So the question is uh, whether Jordan Peterson was involved in making the film and if he's seen it and what his take is. So he wasn't involved in the making of any of it. Uh, it was important for us to maintain journalistic integrity. So he only saw the film once it was done, uh, which also made it a really nerve wracking process <laughs> uh, to sit in the room. And, you know, I said, you know, we'll, we'll take responsibility of, of, you know, what, what it is. Um, Unfortunately, when we showed the film to him as well, Tammy was in the hospital, so it was a bit, uh, you know, exciting to be like, hey, the film is done, but kind of, you know, sad to bring in our laptop on the side table of the hospital bed uh, in August when we uh, showed it to them. Uh, Jordan's mom was also in town, so we watched it with the three of them, and, and the screening went well. It, it's nerve-wracking for Jordan to watch this because he's not able to really see it as a film yet because it's just like reliving really stressful parts of his life that he hasn't properly processed yet. So I think it'll take a few more watches before he sees it as a film and has more commentary for it because uh, it's still kind of at that early stage. But but definitely the three of them all expressed that they really respected the film. They commented on the editing. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, hi. Um, I don't necessarily have a question for the creators of the film, but I did want to state a comment. I, I do want to say thank you for providing a film that pays respect to the very polarized differences and the very polarized uh, perspectives from both ends of the spectrum. I thought it was done with integrity and uh, fairness, and I can't imagine the challenges maybe that would have would have taken. Um, and this film, it's more than a film, I think. I, I think it's a, it's a platform and an arena for public discourse, and I think even in so much as we may have people in this um, theater who either do like the film for what it communicates or doesn't like the film for what it communicates, that that is ultimately what is most important is that it is the, um, the gathering of knowledge and communication and discussion. And I thought this film did an incredible, absolutely incredible job at that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Really, really, really appreciate hearing comments like that because he definitely worked really hard on so that hard, approach. So hard with no money. <laughs> no money. <laughs> you know, sorry, sorry. This was Patricia's first feature, um, and clearly it's already doing well. So, yeah. <laughs> separated him from the movement. I'm going to go on in a hunch and say that most of the people here are pro-Jordan Peterson. Admittedly, I am very pro-Jordan Peterson, but the one thing that I desired the most is uh, for people to demythologize him as a character and get him to the ground level. And I really appreciate what you did with that documentary. As a storyteller, I'm wondering if you were going to share this to any specific audience pro, anti-Jordan Peterson, people in the middle, what audience member are you, do you dream that you could reach with this film? Uh, so I just whispered to her, Patricia, my wife, uh, that I'd like to answer that. We'd love for, I don't know what you would call it, um, center left, left, far left, to watch this film. Because what we find when we're speaking with people about Jordan, we'll be at a house party. Oh, what are you working on? Oh, what's your name? Oh, we're working on this. Oh, that guy? And they're kind of polite at first, you know, because Canadian, you know, Anglo kind of. Um, but then it's like, oh, isn't he in the alt-right? It's like, 
Like, ready? You you need to know what those words mean before you start throwing them around. Um, but for so for, for somebody walking away from that, Jordan Peterson ends up being this like this nine foot character with like biceps like this, and he he's he's when he when he talks, he's throwing swastikas like like a <laughs> like ninja stars, you know. And it's it's not good because what happens is that if you you know, if you see the world with these giant figures, you're creating these enemies. And that's just pure anxiety when you're just walking down the street. When really, it's not that way. And as you can see in the film, so those are the type of people that I would like to see this film. Um, because there are bad people out there that have nefarious intentions. But, you know, in my view, this is not the guy. No. I would just add to that, I, I think, ideally, I would love to have like people on kind of both sides of that spectrum in the same room watching the film together. We did a lot of test screenings in our living room with all sorts of people uh, gathered, you know, about groups of 10 or 12 at a time, just watching the film and telling us, you know, what, what stood out to them. And it resulted in such amazing conversations. And because it was in the comfort of our living room and we had somewhat of a relationship with these people, we were able to bring in people from like self-proclaimed Marxist to diehard Jordan Peterson fans. And we're all in the room together and people are so interested in hearing the different comments that come up so I guess that would be the dream audience okay so the next question's right there I just wanted to say um, the portrayal in this film was very impartial and I liked how uh, like you just said sometimes the uh, far left do like to kind of demonize in a way. They have their fears and they like to kind of funnel it into a figure that's easier to understand for them to face their challenges. And uh, I actually think it's quite a shame that there's been some cancellations. And I think this, uh, this piece needs to be shown in the mass media. I don't know if there's any future plans for that, like any like uh, release on YouTube or Netflix or a social platform, because regardless of what anyone says, I think everyone does, it's like free speech. Everyone does wor deserves to have their voice heard. And this film is another way of showing that we should all see things from other people's perspective. So I think it'd be amazing in the future if you could release it in another way and forget what other people say. <laughs> If anyone in this theater agrees with that, go home, email Netflix, and <laughs> post to them on social media, tweet at them, tell them you want it there. All right, so we have the next question right here. I wanted to ask you whether you had to leave out any scenes of the movie that you wanted to bring in. Did you leave anything out? that was significant. Mm -hmm. There's an awful analogy of being a film editor. It's like killing babies because you have to, like there are scenes you fall in love with and then you just have to let them go. Um, I know that's an awful analogy, but you know what I mean? <laughs> um, I'm sure that, you know, there are so many things that I had fallen in love with that we had to let go of. Let's see what, what pops in my mind. Um, some of it is just extensions of scenes that we had to cut down. Uh, like this is one of the first times where you really get to hear from Tammy because she typically is in the background but has so many interesting things to say. Um, so there are a lot of parts of her interview that I would have wanted to include more of. Um, even at McMaster, like, there's a whole section of after they were in the room, they went outside and, and Jordan gave a talk outside because he really wanted the talk to go on somehow. So it was kind of this epic scene of him standing up on a chair or something outside and people gathered around him. And it's in, in what I think it was March, there's a ton of snow everywhere. Um, and there were still some protesters there in the background, but he's like, yelling out to the crowd. Um, so. There was that scene, um, and actually, we are we are trying to figure out what do we do with some of this extra footage uh, that is still really interesting. And uh, the film will be available for download on iTunes, so there'll be a bit of a bonus content available there and on DVDs. So that's one place where we'll put some additional content. Um, and we're also we also have a page on ThinkSpot. Maybe you can talk a bit about ThinkSpot. Yeah, so we're media creators on ThinkSpot. So we're going to be, when we come up from, for air, uh, we, we'll do um, 
little sequences, little short docs, all the stuff that kind of didn't quite fit in but could work as kind of like a standalone. We'll release those on ThinkSpot for uh, subscribers. It's like there's like two tiers. There's the people that are uh, take the freebies, and then there's a second tier where you pay to get special content. So that's kind of the plan we're going to work with. Um, two quick questions, if I can. One for Jeff. Uh, what was it like to see uh, a fairly small-scale campus event that you organized, or what may have seemed like it at that time, become a huge cultural event? And the follow-up, uh, when is the film about Jordan and Charles uh, coming up? Okay. Um, it was completely un not predicted. Um, I had done some campus activism before and slightly involved in politics over the years, but when uh, Jordan Peterson made his initial video, um, I just thought it was important for there to be a platform that supported freedom of speech. So I threw up that Facebook event, I rented a few uh, amplifiers, and then all of a sudden hundreds of people are clicking attending on the event. And I arrive, and then there are other people with speakers, uh, the people who started playing the white noise. And all these series of events has been quite shocking. And I think it just really pointed to how poignant that moment in history was when those issues were really at the forefront. And um, it's, it's still, over the next few years after that, and all the politics surrounding that, have continued to reverberate through my life and, of course, his life. And um, I think I think that event was good in most respects. But if you saw in the film, there was a gentleman at that event with curly hair who was extremely, extremely mad. And whenever people think back to that event, they always show this individual. But that individual is not a well person. That individual has come to represent a part of that event, which I'm not proud of, which a lot of people that came to the event are not proud of. But it, it, the intention of the event was to allow an open forum, including someone like Jordan Peterson, someone like Lauren Southern, and whatever students wanted to come up. But um, it just showed that even though his message was altogether positive, there were also a lot of negative things that happened from that event as well. But I have no regrets in running that event, and I think it was important that that thing happened and all the things afterwards as well. Oh, and just to she answer the answer second question. part of the other question, uh, the film about Jordan and Charles Mechala, we don't have a release date yet. Um, basically, as soon as this tour is done, we're going to be focusing on that. We're currently looking into funding options. We have a bit more filming to do for that as well. Uh, so hopefully late next year, something like that. But follow our social media, and we'll be posting updates uh, on that. And for the people that are slowly needing to leave, don't be shy about buying a poster on your way out. Uh, OK, so we'll go here, and then, uh, then here, and then we'll go. I would say that it was a very confusing and uncomfortable process throughout the making of the film because 
there's the Jordan Peterson, the person that we knew that we would, you know, hang out with him and his wife and his kids and and uh, have face to face conversations with. Then there's the Jordan Peterson that we experienced through his Twitter account and through media interviews, long form and short form. And so sometimes there would be a period of time where maybe four or five months would go by where we don't have any face to face conversations with him, but it's just what's happening in the media. and. It's like a different person in a way. So it became confusing at times. And then, you know, certain things would come up and it was like, oh, I, I really want to be able to talk to him about that. And what did he mean by that? But we didn't get to, um, you know, uh, to ask all of those questions because he became so, so busy and his time was being uh, demanded by so many people. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a strange process. Um, is there more that you want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, so for those of you that have a little flyer in your hand, you'll see the poster is on one side. So that illustration kind of tells you a lot about what we're trying to do with the film and speaks to what, what Patricia just said, kind of about like the media phenomenon that he turned into. And it has to do with kind of like on his shoulders and in his torso, you got the left and the right, right? You have the blue and the red. And um, these characters on the left, you know, he's the devil, I'm gonna condemn him, I'm gonna point my finger at him while I'm masked. Uh, I got my megaphone, I'm angry. You got the gargoyle on the left side, and on the right side, you have the guy kind of cowering down with a mask of Jordan, and then you got the kind of sinister looking face of a guy with a vote button, kind of like the political guy who wants to use this to kind of push his right wing agenda. And then you have all the selfies. So it has to do with, and the scaffolding on his shoulders is basically the personality, the persona of Jordan was completely created a lot by the media. That's why the film has these media quotes peppered in it to show how much of um, what you guys experience with Jordan has to do with what people say about him for the passive reader, I would say. But for us, it was so different because, um, you know, he's a guy that we used to, you know, drink Quebecois beer with and read tarot cards, you know? So it, it's part of the, the distance that comes with when somebody gets so, so famous so quickly. Okay, so we're up over there. I had to ask, uh, there was a lot of clips, like five to 10 second clips, and it was really well put together. Was the, what was the process to put this film together? Was it storyboarded, or was it just a lot of it on the fly, or a little bit of both? Mm -hmm. a, a lot of uh, all of the above, I guess. So I mean, one thing is, because it was an evolving story, it made it difficult to plan shoots in a in a really organized way. So a, a lot of like decisions had to be made on the fly and kind of be really responsive to what was happening. In terms of the editing process, there was so much footage to go through. We we decided to start by, you know, we had a, a story arc written and rewritten and rewritten and rewritten, but then we we decided the best way to make this work was to construct scenes and then see which scenes just seem to work the best. Because sometimes you have an idea on your head, and you know you were there at, in a, at a moment of filming, but then you put together the scene and it's just not quite working in the way that you thought it was. So it was putting together those scenes and just continually writing and rewriting writing and putting them together and seeing what fits so um, yeah a lot of uh, a lot of reworking and we also had a story editor that we worked with that helped to keep things uh, it was really important to have those fresh eyes because we were just so in it and there was so much content so I would see so much in a in a scene but it would be way too complicated and he would be able to come in and give that perspective and uh, help to simplify and really drill down into the story. So, um, Jeffrey actually has to go, so thank you for joining us on stage for this. So, over here. hello. Uh, hello. Firstly, that was a fantastic movie. Thank you. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, so, I had a question. I mean, it sort of goes back to uh, the question before last, in some ways, which is about effectively about the complexity of people's responses to Jordan Peterson. So, I remember. 
reading the uh, the article that I think the, the professor's name is Schiff, you know, where, where he says, I used to be Jordan Peterson's best friend and now I think he's Hitler, kind of thing. Um, <laughs> you know, I was... So I guess my, I remember reading that and thinking, Christ, I can't imagine ever betraying a friend like that or a close colleague in that way. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, with that in mind and then listening to him talk there, did he express to you personally sort of a complexity of reaction to, to Peterson? And similarly with the, the other sort of harsh critics, particularly the the person at the end who you sort of re-interview, I mean, did, did they also express just this sort of black and white view or is there a more complex reaction to Peterson that we just don't get in the movie and we don't mm -hmm. see in the media? Mm -hmm. I would say that was the case more with Bernie than with Lane because Bernie has known Jordan for such a long time. And interestingly, when Bernie wrote his article, he actually wanted it to be called up close with Jordan Peterson or something to that effect because he wanted to actually show the complexity of Jordan, but the editors are the ones that named it what they did name it. Um, so uh, Bernie, I think, definitely has a, a, a complex view of Jordan, um, but I guess, you know, there's only so much that, uh, that you know, you can fit in a scene and um, that came off in the article. I'm assuming you want to say a bit more about Bernie. Yeah. Uh, so speaking to kind of what we were talking about before, um, so Bernie, uh, Bernie passed away um, about four or five months ago. Um, it was a brain, I, I, I don't know specifically, but it was a condition. Um, so it makes that scene, if you guys get a chance to watch it again, knowing that now, the way it's edited, it's like Jordan and Bernie, they're having a conversation that they never were able to have. They, nothing was, was solved. They never spoke again after the article. And um, so that's, qu that's quite sad. So we wanted to make, the, make that part where Jordan, uh, Bernie says something, Jordan responds. And then so they're having this back and forth for the audience. And I, I think, you know, as... Uh, when we watch that, and now that you know we know that, it, the thing to remember is like this political stuff. I mean, it's just not as important as it seems, and um, people can die, and that's what happened here. And um, so that's another thing. Speaking to that other question of kind of like how do we have difficult conversations? I mean, um, try to do them with respect, and because um, uh, people don't last forever. Okay, I think the next question is up there. Just when you're answering questions or asking questions, just make sure the little red light is on. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my question is, and this may be a bit personal, I'm just wondering, um, during the process of filming the documentary, like, what was it like to f film the documentary and see how Jordan was blowing up, so to speak? It was a bit of a whirlwind, I guess. Um, when when the videos came out and the rallies were happening on campus, I just didn't know what to make of any of it. I, I it was like you know there was the Jordan that we knew, and then the next day. It's it's interesting because I took such a human approach to making the film, and in that first year and a half, like that was okay. But then afterwards, you know, and he's like now the devil and it's like humanizing him is, is now a crime in many people's eyes. So it was just such a strange shift um, to try and make sense of. And I guess another anecdote to share about that is when I first approached Jordan about making the film, to me, he was kind of this big celebrity figure um, just because I had found his work so interesting all of this time and I had created him into, you know, this like larger than a person kind of figure. And now he's a person to me, but to many people he's this larger than life figure. So it's, a, I guess, a strange reversal there. Um, and also, 
the effect that he has on so many people is something that was always there that I saw happening in the classroom, but now it's happening on a much, much larger scale. And I obviously none of us expected that this this huge uh, phenomenon would happen around him. So, gosh, I don't even know know what to say about that. It was just you know it, it kept growing into this more and more unexpected phenomenon, and and we just kind of rolled with it and. Um, paid attention and responded to it as it was happening. All right, so I think we only have time for two more questions. So you got one there, okay. All right, so um, besides the visual part of the movie, I've also focused on the acoustical part. <laughs> and um, the music caught my attention very much, especially in the trailer, because I, I liked it a lot, especially the piano, kind of sometimes minimalistic, but also very epic. So I wanted to ask, did you produce the music um, w like with your own team or um, like what was the process of um, getting that, that audio in your movie and is there any possibility to download it? <laughs> um, so shout out to um, Oliver Johnson and Soleil Sound, they did our music. Uh, so Oliver Johnson composed some original pieces of music and they also have a um, database of tracks called Bed Tracks. So we got some of our music from them and then it was maybe less than a handful of tracks that we got from a database called Artlist. Um, Oliver was amazing to work with. He really was able to get into our heads and understand the direction we wanted to go in with the music. And I think he got that aesthetics were, strong aesthetics were really important to us, but also the music a lot of the time was kind of about stepping back. He's used to, in especially a lot of American films, he said just the music being really in your face and trying to guide you in a certain way. And so uh, I kept on telling him, no, we have to kind of step back a little bit. And so he really, really understood that really well to kind of make the music strong while at the same time capturing that sentiment. All right, last question right over there. Thank you very much for this wonderful film. I enjoyed it. Um, my question is, no, with your knowledge of the man Jordan Peterson himself, what do you think comes next in his life and in the movement that he inspired? So for the people who are his fans, one of the things he talked about is wanting to have an online university that recovers the humanities from what he sees as the negative, the postmodern, neo-Marxist, et cetera, influences and, and um, reevaluates Western civilization in a more positive light. So this is one possible project. There's the intellectual dark web. There's all the things people should do in their personal lives individually, which I think is one of his messages. But also, it doesn't stop with the individual. I think there's some kind of feeling or momentum or, or you know, community that he's inspired that a lot of people want to see continue. But his worldwide speaking tour is, has really taken a toll. It's, it's been quite a ordeal to go through and he's got his family issues. So what do you think he wants to do next? That's a really good question. <laughs> Um, this question came up at our world premiere in Toronto and uh, Will, who's his friend and colleague who's in the film, um, answered it um, you know, as best as he could, saying that he thinks that Jordan is at a, a place in his life now where he sort of has to make a decision. Is he ever going to go back to teach at UFT? They're kind of holding his office there vacant because um, he was on sabbatical and kind of extended leave. He loved his teaching position at UFT, but I don't know if he can ever go back to teaching a classroom of 50 people when he's filling stadiums of 9,000 people. Um, and I don't think he's really had the space and time to stop and reflect and figure out where he's going to go next. He's the kind of person that really likes opportunities and wants to keep going with it. And he's been go, go, go. So it's unfortunate the circumstances that have now gotten him to take a step back and reflect. But I think it's been much needed for a long time. The online university is in progress and being built. It's called... It's called Node. 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 Like to know, but past. Um, do you know the plans of when that's going to be released? Or? I don't know exactly, but it's pretty close. Yeah. I think it's uh, maybe the URL is live. We showed it. Julian showed it. 
can't remember yeah. now. Yeah, his son yeah. Julian's working, uh, one of the people working on that. Um, mm -hmm. He's writing another book that uh, will be coming out next year. Um, I think he'll do another Bible lecture series. Um, yes, he definitely wants to keep doing that. Th when that divinity school got dropped, that really like affected him. Like he was really disappointed in that. Um, so he'll try to make some. I think he'll try to make something like that happen in another route. Yeah. Okay. Well, awesome. Uh, that's the end of our Q and A. We want to thank uh, Mazir and Patricia for coming all the way to Vancouver. I hope it's the first of many screenings and premieres. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for everyone for coming out. We have a number of uh, new events happening in the next few months, so stay tuned with that, and uh, stay tuned with Holding Space Films. And uh, yeah, give it up for our filmmakers. Thank you.